Yeah, my name is Oliver Davis, and this talk is TDD, so it's Test Driven Development or Test Driven Drupal, and we're talking about automated testing and test driven development today. Um, so yeah, just before we get going, I guess for me, this is it's about five o'clock in the afternoon here. I'm based in the UK. Um, my kids are home from school. We may hear kids in the background. I apologize in advance if that's the case, but hopefully not. Uh, the agenda to go through here is why we write tests and how to how to test, uh, what types of tests we have available to us in Drupal, how to run them. Uh, we'll look at an example uh, of a module I wrote using tests and TDD. And then if we have some time, I'm aware we've got a, a 45 minute session, uh, how we can go about building uh, a module with, with test driven development in Drupal. A little bit about me, uh, as I said, I'm based in the UK. Uh, I'm a full stack software developer. Uh, I split my time between working on freelance projects. Uh, so in my spare time, my main day job is working for a company called Invika. Uh, we're a company, we do Drupal development and Magento and some other things. Uh, we're based in the UK and Germany uh, primarily. Uh, there's some links here to my website. I do blogging about Drupal and PHP and lots of other fun things. And uh, my Drupal.org handle and my Twitter username. So I'm, I'm pretty much OP Davis everywhere online. So you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, Drupal.org, et cetera, with that username. And yeah, I mean, maintain quite a few Drupal modules and various other things on GitHub as well. And testing and TDD has become a really sort of important part of that process for me. Okay, so I was talking about override and options module. So yeah, I became a maintainer of this module in 2012. Uh, it's currently the, the 222nd most popular module on Drupal.org in terms of the number of sites currently using it. Uh, so it's currently just over 30,000, which is pretty awesome. Uh, there were some existing tests, which I found really useful. I came to start maintaining the module and adding patches and fixing issues. And yeah, the, these tests were, were critical for me to prevent regressions. So there's, there's one quite large patch that has been there for some time that springs to mind. Uh, there were no tests included with the patch, but it was um, it didn't apply cleanly. I had to do all this merge conflict fixing, and it was just nice to know that the existing test still passed. And then, yeah, I ended up going back and adding tests for the new things afterwards. But just I probably wouldn't have merged that patch if there hadn't been the existing test there already. So let me second, I'm actually looking at the wrong screen here. Let me find my slides. There we go. Okay, so this is a sort of screenshot of the module page um, when I took over the module. Uh, this was uh, 2012 or so. And you can see here that there's Drupal 5, Drupal 6, and Drupal 7 versions. Oliver, we don't uh, see your slides, we just see you. Oh, okay. Wait a second. I'm sharing the screen, I believe. No, maybe I'm not. Apologies again. Oh, I should literally share everything. Okay, fine. <laughs> fun, fun. This is the joy of doing remote talks. This has been funny. Okay, hopefully we see slides now. But yeah, this is a screenshot of the Drupal.org page of the module. And a little bit further down here, we can see uh, there are 9,000 reported installs of this module uh, and 25,000 downloads. Um, these are between Drupal 5, the Drupal 6, and Drupal 7 versions. So Drupal 7 was just over 2,000 usages at this point. So yeah, that's what's highlighted here. So just over 9,000 total. Uh, the newer version of this, this is a, a more recent screenshot, I think from earlier on this year. Uh, we can see now it's 29,000, just shy of 30,000 installs of this module. So it's grown in quite a lot of time since I've been the maintainer of it. Um, so yeah, again, testing for me has been really sort of key for all this. And yeah, we can see that the Drupal 7 versions have jumped to over 20,000 when I took the screenshot back in May. And then Drupal 8, which I wrote um, myself, is yeah, it was over eight, almost eight and a half thousand at this point. So it's a pretty, pretty popular module. So why write tests? Uh, the main one is to catch bugs earlier. Uh, if I'm writing tests on uh, my local code base, I find a bug, I can fix it pretty quickly and the time so investment for that is pretty small. It's not being shipped to production. I don't have to fix it. Nobody's seen the bug. You know, there's a big, uh, it's, called, uh, it's inexpensive to fix it, both in terms of time and also in terms of reputation and things as well, not shipping bugs to production. Peace of mind, uh, I don't wanna break 30,000 Drupal websites. 
So if I'm maintaining a module or applying a fix, as long as the tests are passing, I can be pretty happy that everybody's site is still working. Hopefully, touch wood. And if there's a test for something, then we're going to prevent a regression. We're going to stop that bug coming back if there's a test that shows that we fixed the bug. If we're writing test-driven development approach, then I find I actually write less code taking that approach because I know I'm only writing enough code to make the test pass. I don't have to sort of figure out what I'm doing as I go. And there's maybe some code there that doesn't actually apply. I don't need that code anymore. So I find I write a lot less code doing test-driven development. And the tests also act as their own documentation. So I, I do this a lot with uh, a lot of Drupal 8 projects. I go in on a lot of other projects. I'll go and look at the tests and try and figure out how it's supposed to work. And also, it's a Drupal core requirement. So if anything needs to go into, into core now, it needs to have its own tests to go along with it. And this is all more important now that we can have one code base that works with multiple versions of core. So one module now can work for Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 at the same time, which has never been the case for us before. So yeah, again, just that makes it a lot more important, I think, for me. So as I said, it is a requirement for Drupal core. Uh, there's a thing called the, the core testing gate. And this is basically what, it, what explains what it does. So anything new needs a new test. And then a bug fixes also need a test to show that the bug is fixed. Or we need some sort of example implementation of it. So there's quite a few patches I see on core and in various modules. There's a tag that say needs tests. And that seems to be a bit of a blocker for some people. Um, I guess. So you know, if you want to get your things committed, make sure it has a, a test. And for me, with my open source maintainer hat on, I'm much more likely to review and, and approve patches and pull requests if there's a test that shows the thing is fixed and, and everything else still works. A little bit about testing in Drupal specifically. Uh, Drupal 7 had a module called Simple Test that was part of Core. Uh, it was available, I think, in Drupal 6 as a contrib. It was brought into Drupal 7 uh, as a core module. Uh, it was still there in Drupal 8, but over time it's been phased out. And now we use uh, a tool called PHP Unit by default, which is uh, the de facto testing framework for PHP. And it's used by Symfony and Laravel, and various other projects as well. And yeah, I believe this is still the case that um, Simple Test was planned to be removed for Drupal 9 uh, and has since been moved to Contrib. Uh, I did last of this talk before Drupal 9 was coming out, so I don't know if that has changed since the release, but it was definitely the point why I gave this talk last back in May. So how do you write tests? So in our tests are PHP classes, and they are PHP files with a .php extension. So this is different from Drupal 7, where they would be a, a .test extension. They are just .php files now. They live inside a test directory inside your module and then inside a, a source directory. So very similar to your, your modules, just inside a test directory. And then there's a, a Drupal slash tests slash module name namespace. So if you're writing like controllers and production code or implementation code in your module, you use Drupal slash module name. Uh, so just for tests, we just add that extra test in the beginning there. And then for autoloading, uh, our class name needs to match the file name in order to be autoloaded. And then the namespace must, mass, must match the directory structure again. So these are pretty standard sort of PSR4 uh, and PSR0 auto loading things. And then as far as the tests themselves, they usually break down into three steps. So we have arrange, act, and assert. Alternatively, uh, they can also be called given, when, then. So the first part is setting up some things. Maybe we need to create some users or add some pages. Then the second part is doing some sort of action. Maybe it's going to a URL or checking that a node should exist. And then finally, we're going to make some assertions. Does that node exist? Uh, is this title visible on the page? Do we get the correct response code from our get request? That type of thing. So here's an example. Um, the nice thing about this is sort of ties in that sort of user story type sort of syntax I'm quite used to seeing. I assume most of us are uh, in, in our development jobs if you use development work. Um, so yeah, given given the, about, uh, given the about page exists, when I go to this page, I should see the text about me on the page. 
So that, yeah, this is an example. So this is our namespace for our Drupal tests examples. This is an example module, and this lives inside a, a functional directory. I like to group the tests by the type of test that they are. So a functional text goes to the functional directory. And it just makes things a bit cleaner. We can also use, we can also just say run all the functional tests in one go. Then our class, so this is called the example test, and this extends a browser test based class that core provides us. And this is inside the Drupal test namespace. So the type of test depends on the type of class you're extending rather than which directory it's in. And then inside our class, we have a method which is called test something. Uh, and there we put our actual test code, our we could our given when then steps inside there. There's also a few different ways we can write this. So you can use the sort of typical camel case PSR compliant way. Or we uppercase the word, the, the word something. Uh, alternatively, we can just use test underscore something and use a, a snake case function name. That's fine as well. As long as it's prefixed with the word test, um, it doesn't matter. And some people quite like this approach because it's a bit easier to sort of read and write what the actual test is doing, particularly if they're quite long. Uh, or we could drop the, the test prefix altogether and then use an annotation. So in the last example, we've got an at test doc block annotation. So that also makes it um, makes PHP unit aware of it by the annotation. So some examples of things I test on a project. Um, not, not so recently now, actually. Um, creating some notes when we get data from an API. Calculating attendance figures for an event. Determining if an event is purchasable. So this was a, a Drupal Commerce based um, events management site. So there's a lot of uh, events, I think, here. Um, promotions and coupons for new users. So someone signed up, became a member, they got two new coupons to spend on an event. We had a functionality for cloning an event. So it's just duplicating the existing one and making some changes to it. Uh, queuing private message requests. People could message everybody on their event. There could be hundreds of people. So we decided to queue them. Uh, email some new memberships. They also had a uh, support ticket functionality. So if a ticket was closed and then reopened, we had to test for that too. And also some custom form validation rules. So these are just some things that I tested just on one project. And I quite like this quote. Um, this is from the Laravel Live conference a couple of years ago. And it says that the number one test you should write would be the thing that if you broke, you'd lose your job for, or the thing that's going to cause you the most sort of panic if it, was, if it was to break. What's the most important thing? What's the crucial thing for your project that you wouldn't want to, to break? Typically, that's to do with money. If it's giving people voucher codes or discounts or anything, that definitely needs testing. So the three types of tests uh, we have in Drupal. Uh, the thing with testing is they can be called slightly different things based on the project, but these are the, the Drupal terminologies that we've, that we've used. <laughs> So we have functional and functional JavaScript. So these are a web browser feature functional tests. So these are actually going to say, go to this page and use a browser or use a tool called Mink to actually make requests against a page. Um, we get the other side of the scale, we have unit testing, and we also have uh, integration testing that sits in the middle. So I'll explain a bit more about those now. The functional tests are end-to-end -end tests. These test the whole part of your functionality. So go to the page, does the page exist? Does the actual page exist in your application? So it's text testing in a browser, in a, in a Mink browser, and it's actually testing your, your actual interface. Uh, it interacts with the database, so we can use real nodes, real services, real everything, which makes everything a lot simpler. And behind the scenes, it does a full Drupal installation. It makes, there's a testing profile in, in Core that it uses, so it's quite minimal, it's not a full Drupal install. Uh, but these do make it a bit slower to run compared to the others. So that's something to keep in mind. As I said, there are versions with and without JavaScript, so you can pick the one you want to use based on your use case. Uh, so here's an example that's taken from the block module. Uh, we can see it's, this is just called block test, and it extends a block test base. And we've got a test for testing the uh, block visibility. You can see we're actually using the real config system here and, and getting the values from it. And, uh, actually making a, a quote of sort of real, real block in terms of it, it gets stored in the database and actually does get saved. And once that's been created, we can make actual requests using a method called Drupal get or make actual form requests using Drupal post form or we can actually click a link 
or get user. And then once we do that, for each thing we can check, I can make an assertion. So essentially make a check. Does, does this thing show up? Does the text appear? Does this title appear or not? Is the field checked in the middle example here? So these are quite straightforward to set up. They don't require that much so overhead. Kernel testing are integration tests. They're a little bit lower level. Uh, we can still install modules and interact with services and our container, our database, et cetera, uh, but there's no browser. So we can't make actual get requests or anything. And it's an even more minimal Drupal bootstrap. So we need to do things like tell it which tables to install and which modules to install and that type of thing, which config to install. Because of this, they're faster than the functional tests to run, which is great, but they do require some more setup. We do need to do some more uh, things before we actually get it to run. So uh, another example from the block module, uh, we've got a, a setup method here. So a setup method will just run for every test. Um, so before every test, we're going to go into our container and we're going to get the theme installer and a config factory. We're going to install the block and system modules. So you need to tell it to install the system module, whereas with a, a functional test, that's sort of implied. Uh, we're extending a kernel test based class this time, and there's a, a block creation trait that we can pull in to actually make our block. And then inside the test, we're going to use a block rebuild. We're going to call on the messenger service so we can use the real messenger service in this case again, uh, and then make an assertion that in this case, you know, we've deleted all the messages. So the, best, the last step is just asserting that the messages is, is empty. So sort of similar, we need to do a little bit more setup. If we go back here, we need to get things out of our container. We do need to install certain config or tell it to enable certain tables. The unit tests of the, the last kind, and these are just testing PHP logic. There's no database, there's no browser, there's no service container, there's no um, anything like that at all. But it does mean that they're very fast to run, but we do need to then start looking at mocking dependencies if we're going to use them. Because we can't make an actual request or use a real database, we need to then make a, a fake version, essentially. One thing to keep in mind is that if we do a lot of mocking, then our tests become very tightly coupled to our real code. And then just making little changes and little refactors in our code can make the test break, even though we haven't actually broken the code. So yeah, as I said, this can make it a little bit hard to refactor. So I'd be wary of over mocking, over mocking things. And yeah, one final example, again, from the block module. So we're gonna extend a unit test case this time. And we can see uh, about a third of the way down the screen here, we've got this, uh, it says block expects. So what we're saying here is that we're expecting something to get called on block one time because of this once. We're expecting a method called access to be called um, and return a value, a specific value. So we're saying you know, quite explicitly here, given we've got a, a mocked block, what we expect to go in and what we expect to get back out again. Yeah, if we be if we were to be very tightly coupled here, we could have a problem. Yeah, if we were to change the method access, for example, to something else, our test would fail because it expects the method access to be called, even though our refactor may have been completely fine. Yeah, we've got similar things here again. Block storage expects a method to be called with this value or this array with these values in it, and it will return this. So quite different from our functional test, where we're just saying go to a page, check a response code, does this text appear? This is saying, given this function expects this input, do we get this output back out again? So let's look at an example. This is another, another project that I worked on actually. And this was a, a service called Broadbean that we had to integrate with, uh, a Drupal 8 project with, I don't know. I hadn't heard of them before <laughs> to do this integration, so I don't know whether anybody how well known they are, but they're a, they're a recruitment solution, a job advert solution. What would happen is the client would go in and create job adverts in their UI, and they wanted these to display on the website. So we needed to create nodes for these things in Drupal. We wouldn't post any applications on the site. We would signposting them to a, another system for them to make their applications, but we needed to build a URL that linked them to the correct application. Um, to the correct page of the other application. Too many that <laughs> would application in the same sentence. Um, jobs need to be linked to offices. So they'd specify in their data coming in, which office this would fall, 
obviouses for us were, I think, nodes or taxonomy. So we needed to make a link between the two things. So we could say, show us all the jobs in uh, this office. Job length was the number of days. They'd say how many days a, a job advert was to be displayed for. Uh, they wanted to specify the path. <laughs> so they specified the URL on the broad bean side as to what it would be inside Drupal. And then we construct the application URL. Uh, so we, they'd give us a, we'd have a base domain. You'd have then values like a role ID uh, that we'd add as an option so that they would know which role they were applying for. for. And also some UTM parameters for tracking. So yeah, this, this is how it works. So Broadbean will send some XML to Drupal, and then we build all the stuff, display the nodes on the Drupal side, and then they'd, they'd click the application URL that we'd build, and they'd go off to the, the other CRM system to do the replication. So we added a route to, uh, to Drupal 8 to accept data from their API. So essentially an endpoint. They would send XML to that URL, and we'd use that then to you know, process everything and make our nodes. So we added a, a system user for the API role. So I made a, a module called system user, which is just a, a rather than having just a magic user ID that was responsible for doing this. Uh, we it, it was quite, we had a module with a service that said, give me the system user or system users. And this was, yeah, this only had a role to create API data. We didn't want to give it like a full editor or administrator role for security reasons. We convert the active four value from the number of days to being a timestamp because we, we weren't going to be able to work with the number of days on the Drupal side. But we did want to have the dates, uh, the job hours get removed once the, the active four had been, had been passed. And then, yeah, branch names and locations were passed as plain text because, you know, XML. And we'd have to reference them via entity reference of so linking a job to an office, like I explained. And then the URL, URL alias that we'd map that to the path so that we knew how to get to it. So here's an example. I think this is uh, actually the one from their website, I think, actually, rather than one that we did. So uh, you can see at the top, we've got a command, which is add or delete, if I remember correctly. It's a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, some things in here like active for. So this one's going to be uh, active for a year. Uh, we've got our branch name, which is just a test one. Uh, actually, this might have been one that we did, I think. Uh, there's a job ID. We've got the job title, which would become the no title. We've got some keywords. So um, we're going to split those up and assign them to be you know, um, multi-value text things. Um, same for location. The role ID is quite important because that's their sort of identifier for this unique identifier. And yeah, our URL alias at the bottom is what we'd use for the path. So they knew ahead of time which link to send people to. So yeah, if there's no error, we create the job node and we return a response to Broadbean, just a JSON response, and then they'd be able to know that it was added successfully. Uh, if we just throw some sort of error, maybe a, you know, they give us an incorrect office name, for example, that would throw a, an error, we weren't able to save that. We'd return a, an, an error code, an error message, so they knew what was going on. Types of tests, so we use functional tests um, to correct to make sure we had the correct job nodes with the right URL and make sure we have the, the correct response code. So if something's being created, we should probably have a 201 response, I believe, and we don't end up with you know, 403s for access denied or 404s for, for pages that are missing. We had to do the application URL in the end with some JavaScript because we had some hosting limitations that removed all the UTM parameters. So we ended up having to do this with JavaScript, which is a, a, I wasn't particularly keen about at the time. But I was happier because once I'd written the tests for the JavaScript test, I was happy things were working rather than uh, I wouldn't have been too happy but without, without having the test. And then I think the majority of them were kernel tests. So job nodes could be added and created. Uh, expired nodes were deleted after they'd expired. Made sure that the application URL was generated properly given all the parameters that we've had that we saw before. And then new tests just to make sure that our number of days are, co are converted to the timestamps correctly. So given we get three days and the day is now, what should the timestamp be? So some results, uh, we had zero bugs, which was, which was pretty cool. Um, there were some things that we had to sort of go back and debug afterwards, um, but it was much easier to identify where those things were 
and it turned out to be on not on our side, but it turned out the XML was wrong that we were passed. But because we had the tests, we could say, as long as your XML matches this, or the, the value that you give us matches this, then everything should work fine, our tests are passing. So that was great. We could go back to them with some confidence, which reduced our debugging time. So that was great. We didn't need to go go back through everything from scratch for the tooth comb just to find out that it wasn't actually <laughs> that it was actually still working anyway. And then any new bugs that we did find, we'd add more tests for to prevent them uh, coming back again and having any more regressions. So again, we didn't need to cover everything by default. We're not always going to catch every bug, but it is a constant iterative process. We can carry on adding bugs as we find adding tests as we find more bugs. So now we have lots of tests in theory. Um, how do we run them? So there is a core script inside the core scripts directory that we can run, and it's just called run test sh. And we can specify a thing, it will run all the tests, or we can specify a module or a class, and it will just run the tests for that, that class or that module. If we're using PHP unit, which uh, I am, well, I think everybody is now exclusively, I assume, um, or core is at least, uh, we can just run PHP unit directly itself. So it's in our, biz, our bin direct, vendor bin directory. Uh, obviously, we're going to run these locally because we wouldn't want to put, put PHP on production. Uh, we'd specify where our php.unit, php.unit.xml file lives. In this case, it's usually within the core directory. Uh, there's a, a php.unit.xml.dist, which lives inside core. So we just need to specify which directory it's in. Typically, we'll look in the current directory we're in, but we need to, you know, there is no file there, so we need to tell it where it is. And then we can specify any number of arguments. So this is just the path to the module we want to test. So this is our examples module. There's other options we can pass here as well, like a filter and other, and other things, which I think of examples for. So the PHP unit XML file uh, just configures PHP unit. Where are our tests? What do we do when a certain thing happens? That type of thing. Uh, and we need to run some types of tests, like our browser tests and things. We need some value to inside there. Uh, it's ignored by Git by ignored by Git by default. So our PHP unit XML .dist is in core. We can usually copy it, call it PHP XML, but it automatically gets not added to our code base, which is great. There are some URLs and things in there that will be specific to your project. So let's have a normally just copy this and, and rename it. And there's a couple of variables in here that we need to change again based on our project. So symbol test base URL is the URL that if we're going to make a, a request to a, a Drupal get request to a page, what's the URL that we want to prefix that with? So that might be localhost, or it might be mysite.ddev.site or anything. Uh, the simple test DB is the database we're going to use to connect to and store our database in. This could be MySQL, it could be SQLite. I tend to use SQLite most of the day now. And then browser test output directory is if we're writing functional tests, it will take screenshots of every step and put them into a file, which is great. And then stop on failure true is good if we're, run, if we're doing test-driven development and we just wanted to stop after we have a failure, then we could just add this line and we, we don't get all the failures and then it tells at the end there were 10 failures, it would just fail on the first one and stop, you can fix it and go away. So test room development uh, is just a slightly different workflow. Uh, so we start by writing our test first, which when you first begin doing this, it feels quite strange. Like, you know, I want to write my code first and then write my test afterwards. But TDD suggests we, we write the test first. And we only write enough of a test for something to fail or for the, the code not to compile. We don't really have compiling in PHP. And usually, you know, PHP Storm will give me a, a little underline and say, this you're missing a method or something. But only you don't write all of your tests in one go. You just write enough to have one failure. You then write some code. So if we're making, if we're saying go to this page and we're getting a, a 404, that page doesn't exist. For example, we can write some code to make the page exist. We run the test again. Our test is going to now go into pass because our page now exists. And then now everything is green, everything is passing. We can then do refactoring. So maybe we've done, you know, just make that in pass. Maybe we've just returned a hard coded string, for example, just to get it passing, or we've done, you know, something just to, yeah, just to get the, the objective is to get the test passing as quickly as possible and then refactor once that's the case. 
and then just keep going through that that process. So again, we might just a test may take several iterations to to complete to have a passing test. Yeah, you don't need to you don't need to write everything in advance, then make everything pass. That's sort of not the plan. Uh, here's a diagram, so I've shown that again. So typically, uh, it's tests when tests are green, they're passing; when they're red, they're failing. And blue is usually refactoring. So it's this constant TDD loop of failing, passing, refactoring, and then the next go around again and add another failure and go, keep going. And we're at. So yeah, it's a typically red, green, blue, or red, green, red, green refactor. Yeah, and this is sort of the process I used when I was moving um, modules from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So I'd make a new branch, I'd update any tests, or, or add, maybe add some tests if they weren't any there before, write the code to make the test pass. Again, this might be multiple loops around that TDD cycle that we saw. And then we can refactor and then just, again, just keep repeating, keep going around that, that cycle. So there's sort of two ways of, of we can approach TDD. We can either start in, outside in or inside out. I tend to do the outside in approach, which means I start with functional tests first. And then once I've found something that I can't do with a functional test, I'll drop down to an, another secondary loop and I'll start writing an integration test or a unit test. So maybe in, back to the Broadbean example. Um, yeah, if I'm writing the thing that says delete the job when the thing is expired, I can write as much of the test as I can. But when I need to calculate the end date, I start writing the unit test at that point. Once that's passing, I can go back up again. This, this comes as a switching between loops. It's a term called programming by wishful thinking. So it's sort of write the code that you wish you had in your tests. So even though you're writing, you're maybe referencing functions and methods and classes and services and things that don't exist yet. It's sort of like you don't care and you sort of just write the ones that you wish you had in advance. I'm trying to think like, what's the best way of this? What's the right sort of API or the right into the right way of working with these code with this code? Which means you end up with a, you know, and then you just go and write it in that way. So this is why it's a lot cleaner. So I write less code doing this because I'm only writing what I want there to be. And yeah, typically I write the comments first. If I've got my given when then or uh, a range act assert, I will paste those in and then start filling the code and then sort of removing the comments backwards. And so yeah, removing the comments, that's what I meant. Uh, and backwards, I will write the assertions first sometimes. So it doesn't need to be uh, a range act assert. Sometimes I will start with the assertion and I'll think, okay, I'm doing a thing that needs a page. I'm like, what's my end? Like, I want there to be a page here that's, you know, there needs to be a response, which is a, a 403, it's gonna be access denied. And I'll then go back, okay, what do I need to do to make that thing? So I need to call a Drupal get on a page and make it work. And then, okay, what do I need to do in order for that to go? And so it went way backwards rather than starting at the beginning. So I found that to work quite well. I'm actually doing pretty good here for time. I thought it was gonna take a little bit longer. There we go. Um, so we got a little bit of a demo here. So we've got an example of building a blog module. Uh, so it's got some acceptance criteria. So as, as a site visitor, I want to see a list of published articles at slash blog and have those ordered by a uh, post date. So again, I, I see if people are working for agencies or working for freelance, we're probably used to seeing this sort of acceptance criteria format. It's given when then or as a, as a person, I can do this so that I can do that. So in order to achieve this, uh, there are several tasks. We need to make sure that the blog page itself exists. Uh, we need to then make sure that only publish, publish articles are shown. So we don't want to see unpublished articles. We don't want to see um, pages or any other content types in this, in this setup. And we want to ensure that articles are in the correct order as well. So, so I'm not gonna do any sort of coding. What I do have, is um, a GitHub repository, which is, uh, let's see, workshop. Okay, I can't, it's not going to complete. Bear with me a second. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, sure. Testing code. Okay, so here's the example. Um, 
lots of bit of a demo. So this is something that I did for um, Drupal Camp London earlier this year. I did sort of a workshop version of it, and I'm doing it again for Drupal Camp New York in a couple, in a couple of weeks or next month or something. Let's come around pretty quick again. Uh, we can see here I, I'm doing this same example. Everything's broken down by the number of commits. I, I tend to do very atomic commits usually when you're doing this type of approach. And we can see exactly how we're going through this constant um, loop of, of things passing, things failing, going back again. So, yeah, um, this is on GitHub. Uh, people can go and, and check it out. And um, this is using GitHub Actions, actually, which could be a, a whole separate talk if, if you want to see how that works. But I've got a, a job here that runs the tests. Let's make this slightly bigger. There we go, we can see. So this is another reason why I split tests up into their own directories. In fact, there's a open my PHP init config file here. We can see um, some things. So yeah, these are called test tweets. So I've got one called functional, one called curl, one called unit. So these match to the types of tests that uh, we've, we've talked about. And I can say that functional live in this directory or this path glob. So yeah, any custom module that has a test directory that has a functional directory, likewise kernel, and then again for unit, uh, specify my base URL here, and simple test DB. So this is my database. This is using SQLite database, which I, I quite like doing. So yeah, if I go back here again to my GitHub actions, we can see yeah, this is what I'm using. These are my three test types and my three test suites. And I'm using the Symphony web server, which is quite nice for, uh, for these things. And then yet again, if the test types is functional, we're going to start a web server because we need something to make the requests against. And then, yeah, it's going to loop over. Again, each of the, where is it? These, yeah, it's a we'll loop over each of these and then specify, yeah, the test suite in here using the matrix matrix.test types. Uh, value. So it's going to run each of those and then finally again if it's a function it's going to stop the web server. So yeah, any push to this repository, let me just see, yes, any push, anytime I do a push to this project, it's going to trigger a new build. And yeah, we can see again any of these I'm going to push. They've got one here that's using DDEV. And yeah, we just go in and see exactly what it's doing. We can see executing tests here. We can see exactly what it's, what it's outputting. So this is the command that it's running. Uh, this text docs flag is quite nice. It gives you this sort of output with, uh, rather than seeing, usually just see sort of dots on a screen or, or some type of letters involved in it. But I quite like this, uh, this sort of output using test docs. And yeah, it's so then it's gonna run each of them. And then at the end, it's gonna just tell us that everything's passed. Uh, you have six tests and eight assertions. And yeah, if I go in, just one of these tests, we'll see exactly what it's doing. So uh, it's inside my custom module. And let's just see maybe one of the blog page tests here. So yeah, we're extending that browser test base. Uh, we do specify the default theme. So I think 8.8, .8, I believe that's the thing we need to do. Uh, which modules are we going to install? So we have to make sure we enable the module we're testing. That's caught me out a few times. Uh, and I typically like this, this syntax of using the annotation and writing quite verbose test names. Uh, this makes it a lot more readable, at least for me. And then this is the same. The, the test docs flag is going to use this and make a sentence out of it. But it's much easier to see exactly what's going on. Yeah, we can see here we've got our Drupal get. So we're going to go to the blog page. We're going to see, is it does it have a, an OK response, a 200 response? Does it have a, a blog title? And does it have uh, the words block onto my blog on it? And again, if I just show you that quickly, time, 45 minutes. If you open up the blog page controller, you can see this text is inside inside here. So this is the end, the, the end of this, obviously. But yeah, if you do want to go through it step by step, then the, the commits are there in order to do that. And then also um, see that yeah, again, it's sort of broken down here. So actually step by step how you'd go implementing this as well. Um, I did a version of this for NWD, for the, the Northwest Drupal Group in the UK, um, where I actually went through some of this, or maybe all of it, um, as, a, as a sort of a demo, which was quite fun. So that's um, on my YouTube channel, on the, oh, sorry, on their YouTube channel, which is linked to from mine as well. 
again, I'm doing this that, this workshop again for Drupal Camp New York um, soon. So yeah, definitely feel free to come along to that if you want to go through this in real time. So again, I, I did this talk uh, a few years ago actually now for uh, another group of Drupal Sunset in the UK. And I saw this on the Slack channel afterwards, and this is just a, a screenshot of um, somebody running some tests, and we can see that it's green and passing. So uh, yeah, I made a tweet and said this this made my day afterwards. So somebody uh, you know, had watched this talk and then gone away the next day and wrote some tests, which was awesome. And yeah, they just said afterwards that the talk really sort of inspired them and drove them to do testing, because they're maybe a bit nervous beforehand. And again, sort of what I was saying about this peace of mind thing, and they felt a lot more peace of mind from having written these tests and also found a bug which they wouldn't have had otherwise, which they wouldn't have done otherwise. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, I am writing a, a book or a course or something. I've been doing this on and off for, for quite a while, but yeah, if you want to go to testdrivendrupal.com, you can sign up there and get it to my mailing list. And there's also a GitHub repository where I'm building an application out with this, uh, this thing. Um, yeah, this this is what's coming up next. I believe we're going to talk more about that in a, in a moment. But um, if you have time for questions, uh, this type of questions now, or you can reach out to me online after afterwards if people want to. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I don't. There was no uh, questions in the chat yet. Okay. Fine. I'll say the details are here. So yeah, if anybody wants to afterwards, they can get in touch. I'm on uh, yeah, Opie Davis on the Drupal Slack as well. So yeah, I'm on the Drupal Slack and Twitter here, and Drupal Dog and GitHub and all these places. Here's so one from Arlena. Feel free to reach out. Um, mm -hmm. They ask um, between running, what is the difference between running the tests from a run test.sh versus calling vendor.bin PHP unit directly? <clears throat> Um, I don't sure there's much of a difference now. Um, beforehand, you could only run the PHP unit tests. So you had to extend a PHP unit test case in order to make them run through PHP unit. Uh, whereas before, I guess in the early days of Drupal 8, we had some that we were still based on simple test, which was the, the sort of legacy testing system. So those you couldn't run through PHP unit. Uh, so you would have to have done that with a run test script. Uh, I believe the Drupal CI and Drupal test bots are, are still run using the run test script, but yeah, I tend just to run it through PHP unit personally, because um, that's what I do with Symfony and other projects as well, if I work on anything else. So I'm probably more familiar with the switches and things there as well. I know there are things like filter, so you can say filter just to give a, a certain class name or uh, things as well. I don't know whether run test supports everything that PHP unit does directly. Okay, I have you used Drupal test traits? Um, I've seen it mentioned. I don't think I've used them, at least not much. Something maybe for you to look at before I finish doing the course, or at least maybe I should give them a test anyway. How do testing, how do testing frameworks fit in like BHAT, for example? Yeah, so BHAT is very similar to the PHP unit functional tests. You sort of, like they both make requests against a real site or at least an actual page. Um, they do it in a slightly different way. They both use the same Mink driver, actually. So the syntax, I guess, is, is a different thing. So using BHAT, you're writing BHAT tests. You're actually writing the given when then syntax, like in plain English and such. Um, and then you're, you're writing code to make that work so you could write completely custom b hat scenarios and then behind the scenes you're writing the this sentence equates to drupal get whatever so it, it's slightly different but the same thing um b hat can be great if you're using user stories a lot maybe you've got a ba or a product owner or something who's writing these user stories and you could copy them into your b hat and, and run them uh, i typically will just use the php unit ones if i can because they're already there, I don't need to add another dependency into my project. And yeah, I would use PHP in it again in, in a Symfony project or anything as well. That said, I do use BHAT in Symfony as well. So it depends. But yeah, BHAT and functional tests are very similar. They did the same type of idea. 
Uh, okay, let's if you have projects of incredibly tight time scales, not only capacity for single developer to build, what is your recommendation for types of testing? Okay, so you, you don't need to, to test everything. And, and there's definitely sort of people will say, oh, I've got 100% test coverage or whatever. I don't think that's the right goal. Uh, if I was down for time, I would definitely try and prioritize whichever is the crucial thing in that project and make sure that is definitely tested. So there could be some less low level things where I'd be not, I guess, not happy for them to break, but I'd be less concerned if they did break, you know, maybe the, the impact of them is going to be less. And, uh, whereas if it's something like when someone joins up or someone leads an event, we want to give them a 10 pound voucher discount code or something like if that was to be wrong and we gave them 10 discount codes for an example or we gave them one with you know a million pounds or something by default just to think of you know some slightly out there examples but you know if that was to break then i'd be more concerned obviously right so i guess if, yeah anything to do with money anything to do with user facing stuff i'm more likely to test those if i had to make a choice uh, that being said like when i've gone on to projects to do a lot of testing um they it takes some time maybe to get into it again if you've come from a project that's not doing it but once i get into it it actually doesn't take that much more time uh, because you're writing the test first i found is you sort of go into like an autopilot type stage i don't need to be thinking oh what's the next thing i need to do i'm just running php unit and it's telling me what the next thing is to do and it's saying oh you're getting the wrong response code and i'll be okay to make the route okay but now the test is failing for a different reason, so I need to go back, and it's sort of that automatic sort of mode, which is actually quite good. So in that way, it actually takes sort of less, I want to say less time, but I get the other thing with that as well is it might take more time at the beginning, but it's going to take less time when you start having to bug fix everything. So you're sort of moving the time, I guess, but you're not having to deal with you know, bugs and things on production, I guess. But yeah. I've had it before. I went onto one project that had zero tests, and then by the end it had a hundred or so, which was you know quite good. But yes, I, I don't test every project. There's some clients who maybe don't want to sort of pay with testing, or maybe we have a client maybe on like a you know, one day retainer or something, or a very small retain retainer, so we can only redo sort of I want to say the, the bare minimum. But you know maybe just doing sort of upgrades and modules and things, and maybe making very small changes. So. And in that case, it's it's harder to sort of go back and add tests to existing things, I found. So that's um, that's harder. But yes, definitely try and if you only have so much time, I, I'm quite ad, quite an advocate around testing. I've gone to project managers and, and product owners and tried to really sort of sell the benefit of why we want to do this testing, why we want continuous integration to run the test and redeploy and that type of thing. I haven't had that many problems so far. I've, yeah, I, I sort of, yeah, as well as sticking to my guns too much, picking my battles, I think, and yeah, finding a compromise. Let's test you know, this feature, maybe not this one. Even if you don't have time or budget to write unit tests, at least remember to always write testable code. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Always, yeah, maybe if you can't write the tests, maybe yeah, just write them in a, a certain way. That means it would be easier to go back and write them later on. But yeah, again, I'm not talking specifically about unit testing uh, all the time. So yeah, we have uh, we talk about other things as well. If a client is pushing tickets uh, with everything being an emergency, yeah, that happens sometimes. It has to be done there. How do you sell testing to the client? Yeah, that's that's a good question. This whole thing about selling testing is quite quite interesting. And there's, there's discussions around you. Are you a professional developer if you don't do testing, that type of thing? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, like, it, it can be hard because in a, in a client's eyes, you're just, you're writing more code and like, almost like why, oh, goodness me. Like they're not, they sort of expect you to do it right the first time regardless. Now I've actually just sometimes just written tests, you know, and not sort of told people that I'm doing it, but not in a sort of a way that, you know, it's it's about it's sort of, you know, as a as a senior developer or, or a lead developer or um professional developer even, you know, i it's sort of part of the package in some ways. Like um people know that yeah, like 
possibly PMs of it. Does a client need to know? I'm not always sure, but it's definitely a, a discussion point. But then, you know, if if it's gonna be a case of you know maybe you spend another half an hour and you write some tests, you know, and you could be okay. That's we're not going to get a bug because X happened. You know, I'm sure they'd be happier that you know you're not going to give people the wrong voucher code or something you know, at some point. But yeah, again, it's. One thing I'd definitely say is like, don't say, you know, if someone's asking you for an estimate for something, like don't say, oh, it'll take an hour and then three hours to write the tests, you know, because then that's going to get taken off the estimation sheet right away. Like again, it's, and, and as you do more TDD and you're always switching between testing and, and tests and, and the implementation code, the line gets blurred anyway, right? So you can't really say, oh, it's, it's maybe it's, it's not 50-50 even uh, that way. So. Yeah, in, in the same way, like I wouldn't write. Like I got asked this once when I was doing a, a presentation on this for a company, and you know, I, I said like I wouldn't write bad HTML, and then said I'm going to charge you X amount to write good HTML. You know, I'd just write the good one to begin with, and you know, it, it's part of that just means you know, test again. Yeah, like that says, yeah, sell comes as, as part of the estimation for the work exactly. And yeah, again, the more you do it, the quicker you get at it, and you know, it doesn't take as much time to do because you know you're used to it at this point, I guess. The problem is being patient enough with writing tests; you don't have to accurately estimate it. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. Yeah, but again, like as as you write them all, it does definitely get easier as it does with anything, I guess. Really, you know, once once you know what you're doing with it, um, I'd say start small. Like, and the thing with the functional tests, I don't mean small as in testing small bits of code. I mean, the functional tests are really easy to go in and, and start adding to a project. And they really quick to, like, they require very little setup. They can be quite, you know, very straightforward. I think some of the, the ones in here are sort of a good example of that. And these arguably provide the most value as well because they're actually testing real things. So if we look at one of these functional tests, like this test in 28 lines of code is testing that the blog page exists. So we can be confident now that the blog page is never not going to be there. So there's a lot more value attached to that compared to sort of um, does two and three equal five type of thing. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm not sure whether sneaky, <laughs> maybe sneaky isn't the right word, but yeah, exactly. Read through a bunch of tests in core. I'm not sure how to go about starting a test from scratch. Okay. Yeah, again, I, I definitely say like a lot of people when they look at testing, they sort of immediately think about unit testing, and then they start thinking about you know all these things about like mocks and etc. Like that can obviously get quite more, a bit more complicated. Like I would say with this, like this isn't too. Bad. I think most of this is pretty normal. Like this, this is writing a class, so most, most of this should be pretty familiar to, you know, to most people. Um, and yeah, again, like this is just the bit here that we need to to focus on. So again, it's just figuring out that those stages of um, a range after third or given when then, and you know what are the things you actually need to do there. So again, this is why sometimes I do it back to front and I sort of think of the outcome first. I, I think, okay, I want this text to be on my page, but I don't have a page yet. So then I go back to this bit and then I go back to this bit. So this is, is true. But yeah, I definitely start with these types of tests. These are pretty sort of easy, I think, to, to get going with um, and yeah, arguably add the most value. And then when you sort of get to the end of these, then look at maybe starting to do the other types of test possibly maybe that's something i'd recommend definitely take a look at this repository if you want to if you want you know and, and look at the, this is actually broken down step by step so we can see here how i'm actually doing things step by step and yeah we've got yeah add the first functional test we can see that is the whole test but let's see what if there's an actual example here blog page blog page functional test so this is the one for the actual blog so we can see that the this is all done with the TDD approach. So you can see that there, like this one's failing. And now we are adding the blog page routes. And so see sort of step-by-step step how I've done it. And I've tried to be quite descriptive about the, the, the commit messages and things to sort of explain how to do it um, from there. Yeah, again, I think we can, I can turn this on here very quickly. 
on my YouTube, there is some live streams that I've done some testing. I definitely recommend people going and checking that out if they want. But the one I'm trying to find is do, 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 do. Uh, public speaking. Where are you? There it is. So these are all the talks I've done, or the ones there's videos of, and the one I'm looking for is the this one, I think, maybe, May 2020, where I've basically done this talk and then gone through that demo. We had you know, some meetup talk. We weren't quite so tight for time. So uh, I did sort of go through it. Or, you know, if you are planning on attending the, the workshops at Drupal Camp New York, I'll be doing the like a four-hour session of going through that example. Maybe something else a little bit different there as well. So, yeah, I'd love to see some people there again. Let's see, definitely done things in a better way. The client cared about being peace of mind. Yeah, I mean, I guess like you're not going to go to a client and say, can I use this design pattern or can I do this? So this may be an argument of why would you ask them if you could do testing? That's uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit controversial, but let's see. But yeah, I definitely, it's with my um, like you know, day job hat on, it's def definitely happier when I've got tests to cover my work. And again, with my open source, module developer hat on, I don't want to go to bed thinking, have I broken 31,000 Drupal websites? Yeah, and again, it's not going to catch, you're not going to catch every bug. There's still going to be bugs, probably, maybe, probably. But the idea is to maybe get less bugs. But as we fix a bug, we add a test to show the bug has been fixed and that bug can't come back again. So the, like, you're not going to catch probably every edge case or every use case out of the box. It is that continual sort of progress. Yes, all human mistakes happen. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Cool, okay. Any more questions for anybody? Um, yeah, I should, I should have a, like a resources slide on this talk, really. Um, I don't think I have one. I'll find one I'll tweet them out later on. But again, yeah, always feel free to yeah, find me on Drupal Slack or Twitter or GitHub or Dita or anywhere else. Or yeah, come and join the session in New York and or not in New York, but online for New York. That would be awesome. Cool. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um just being sorry for the technical difficulties earlier on. I don't know what's going on there, but yeah, hopefully I'll be I'm gonna try and hang out a little bit. This was the next hour or two maybe around the conference as well so maybe i'll bump into some of you on the networking that'll be cool as well awesome thank you very much